I feel like this is a good place to say uh, that Doug Baker, our guest, already asked me, what are you doing here? after 20 years of covering iPhone launches and venture capital and space economy. And it's because Marketplace Tech just launched a series uh, called How We Survive, and we've been looking at how technology is gonna help us adapt to climate change, uh, which is how I landed at this highly unusual, for me, conference. But I'm really looking forward to our conversation with Doug Baker, the chairman and CEO of Ecolab. Let's get right to it. We're already like a minute down on our time. Come on up, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> You're chopping us. How are you? <laughs> you can tell I'm in radio. Yeah. I'm looking at that clock. Exactly. Uh, Doug, you've been president and CEO of Ecolab since 2004. Yeah. And what I want to ask you, it's a $15 billion company just across the river in St. Paul, uh, providing businesses with cleaning, energy, and water services and products. How big a part of your business and your sort of renowned sustainability efforts is water? Uh, the majority. So the big businesses we're in is, are food safety broadly, kind of farm to fork, and we're the leaders around the world serving clients in 170 countries. Food safety, the number one ingredient in hygiene and or food safety is water. So that's a big part of that component. And then the second business is really helping all industries use water wisely and increasingly how do you recycle water, reduce footprints in water? When you do that, you also reduce carbon emissions because when you use water, you have to heat it, typically move it, and treat it. And if you can do something with 30% less water, you'll use a lot less energy as a consequence too. So it's a complete cycle. So it's, it's roughly 80 plus percent of our business is heavily influenced by this work. And a part of that business is convincing other businesses, right, to adopt these technologies, to use and think about water in this way. What is the business case for that? Well, the, the great news, at least early, is the smart way of using water is to reduce it. You end up reducing, as I just mentioned, energy, which means you reduce cost. So the ecological and economical align here. When they align, you typically get uptake. When they're misaligned, you have to work very hard to understand how do you more closely align them so that you move forward. I agree, I mean, I think Erica earlier said, you know, investing the false god out there, or the myth is that somehow ESG investing is lousy returns. I would also say I think the myth out there is investing in sustainable technologies is a bad return is also a myth. Mm -hmm. How? You know, we also heard a lot about systemic change in that session and yesterday. And I wonder, you know, as companies take up your products, as they start to adopt this business model, how does that contribute to systemic change, business by business? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think there's different levels of evolution for companies. And one of the big ones in the early stage is clearly how do you make more with less? And people go, why make more? Well, we're going to have 9 billion people on the planet. We're going to need more food. We have to figure out how to make more food in many ways or reduce waste and do things with less energy, less water, et cetera, less impact. And so producing equal or more with less is a fundamental important state. But that alone isn't going to solve all of our issues. We're also going to have to make sure so the, the crack on, you know, or the oyster positive company, which is hysterical, but I would also say we do have to end up creating, if you will, systems that are more virtuous. And so that's why this whole circular economy idea has such strength. There, there are many and several good examples, but what we need is to make this a core part of how people go to market, how they structure things, how they think through design, et cetera, and once it becomes part of design, you end up with very, very different outcomes. Right now, it's afterwards, right? We try to fix all this stuff afterwards, and it's not the positive way to get to the right solution or answer. You talk a lot about reduction of water use for obvious reasons. What about on the circularity idea? What about reuse? Is that a part of your model? Oh, yeah. No, I would say, you know, we, we do a couple of things. One, 
So, so let me just give you some examples, and, and I don't know how familiar you are with water in, in total. So there's a lot of water on Earth that kind of fools us and deludes us. Less than 1% of the water on Earth is fresh water or usable fresh water. And most of that is not the surface water that we see, it's underground. And so really the, the main water resource that's core to healthy living is underground and out of sight. And so as a consequence, water is very misunderstood, the scarcity issue around it, the finite supply with growing demand. And when you put on climate change, it just exacerbates an already tough situation. You then have what I would call mispricing of water. So a barrel of oil today is, I don't know, 54 bucks roughly this morning, US 64 bucks in Europe. The equivalent water is less than a quarter. So it's priced very cheaply, actually underpriced what it costs. And we get into the human right to water, I, uh, and, which I agree, but at the end of the day for industry and others, we're gonna have to price this appropriately, and we're gonna have to understand it. And humans' right to water originally was not pipes into caves. And so it costs money to have this water infrastructure, and by the way, it brings a heck of a lot of value. So today you have one out of nine people on Earth do not have access to clean water. They are walking and schlepping water great distances, burning huge amount of calories and time and economic advantage, just bringing water for daily life. And so eight out of nine of us are using too much, one out of nine of us don't have access. But it's not as simple as the eight out of nine of us reduce our consumption and magically the one out of nine are gonna have water because it's a very local situation. So when California goes into drought and a crisis in water, it doesn't have an impact on Minnesota. Right. And, and what we need to understand is how do we solve this circularly on a grand scale and also on micro scales, plant by plant, watershed by watershed, et cetera. And there are a lot of great technologies to do this. Well, and we're, we're kind of skirting around this idea of inequity and inequality of availability, of the impact of climate change, of, of business solutions to tackle that impact. And so I wonder, you're selling a product to companies that can afford it. And even though it may save them money, not every company can afford it. And I wonder how you address in that sort of systemic way inequalities that can come up as a result of some outlets being able to afford conservation techniques that others cannot. Yeah, well, that's, I, I would say our, our approach right now is we're so early scratching the surface and I'm a proponent of when you know you have something that's gonna help, get moving on it, and then figure out how to make it better and broader. But don't sit waiting for all the lights to turn green before you start moving. So we know water scarcity is real. The projection is we'll have a 40% mismatch between supply and demand as early as 2030. I mean, it's right around the corner. Mm -hmm. And you already have this appearing in many parts of the world, particularly emerging markets, where you have fast industrialization, i.e. growth in water consumption and growth in human consumption, and you have finite water supplies. And they don't have the systems and the rest. So right now, we think it's a good idea for anybody to save water, mm -hmm. right? There's no negative. So, okay, if it's ABI and InBev and the big breweries versus the local breweries, that's okay. Reduction in water, reduction in energy is a positive thing, period. Mm -hmm. We will work to make our stuff more available for those who can't afford it. The truth is, almost everybody can afford it because we typically put the capital in place, don't ask for upfront charge, and it's almost a immediate benefit economically. Mm -hmm. The hard part is getting people to believe. So the more sophisticated buyers are willing to take this on faith because we can demonstrate over time that it's actually delivering smaller, often are more skeptical, and it takes a while. Once this becomes common use with the large players, I think smaller players will adopt as well. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. I wanna remind you that if you do wanna submit a question on Twitter, it's at GreenBiz or, and or hashtag Circularity19, uh, and we might sneak that in, although I have 10 to 100 questions here for you. Right. Um, we've talked a lot about water quantity so yeah. far. What about quality and what about pollution? I mean, you do make some industrial chemicals here. Yeah. 
Well, absolutely, and I would say th that's why at best you have finite water supply and growing demand. You know, the truth is a little more complicated than that. You have a little bit of a shrinking supply because of groundwater pollution and the like. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I mean, China, over a third of its water, groundwater, is estimated to be polluted, i.e., it's not as simple as sticking a straw down earth, which is what we like to do, and pull it out. You shouldn't use it. So this is a big food safety issue. It's a big human health issue, et cetera. So absolutely, yeah, we, we make, we use chemicals to manage water quality. Mm -hmm. Water has got the unfortunate attribute of being a chemical. It's what it is. And if you're going to go manage water, right, chemically, you got to understand how you release and, and make sure that you can manage it in systems. So water by nature is corrosive. Mm -hmm. It likes to carry X number of minerals. If you get to the heart of the Flint tragedy, what really is happening is water likes to leach minerals out of everything it touches, and when it's running through pipes that have lead in it, it leaches lead out of the pipes, and unless you treat the water in such a way that it's not hungry to leach lead and or other minerals. There are lead pipes throughout the United States and in parts of Europe. It's not just a Michigan story, but the water's treated so that it doesn't leach. And so the big miss there was understanding the system change and what we needed to do, but the science is age old. Right, it wasn't complicated, it was just like, a, it's, it's a very complex, it's hard to understand what the heck happened. Yeah. But that's the situation with water. So certainly we've gotta go chemically do it. We work very hard to understand how our chemicals interact with earth and everything else. What we really work to do is understand total impact. And so if we sit and have complicated discussions with NGOs and the rest, it's often on processes. And what we do, so I'll take, give you a simple one. We sell, the cleaning stuff that is used by most of the hotels, including this one, to clean sheets and towels. It's industrial laundry application. So what is the system that we've developed? It basically can do the laundry in three cycles versus six in half the time, uses 50% less water, 40% less energy to wash a sheet with our stuff versus others. Mm -hmm. Now you can find greener formulas but those greener formulas will use a lot more water, a lot more energy, a lot more plastic, because it takes a lot more of it to get the product clean, and in total impact on Earth, we'll just line it up and say 90% less plastic, we'll have a quarter of the CO2 in shipping, we'll have 40% less CO2 in, in using, in producing or process, we'll use less water, and we'll have this impact going down the sanitary sewer, which total, we think Earth is way ahead. Mm. And it's never as simple as an ingredient or anything else. What we really want to understand is what's the total impact. Mm. I mean, you walk into our R&D halls, and our whole thing is Earth responds to what actually happens. It doesn't respond to what we believe is going to happen. And so it's very important to understand what the true impact of any of these processes are and what's really going on. And I would say this is a big, big challenge for all humanity because we like to believe convenient truths, whatever fits our model. And unfortunately, I would say the science is much more complicated than that. So you got a bunch of climate deniers. I don't get it. Seems pretty obvious if you look at the science. And then you'll have a lot of people who really mean well, but they want to do things that if you look at total impact, you go, oh my God, this is not going to help. This could cause real harm. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about it, think about it, and understand it. And everybody, I think, has got to be open. We need big change. And with big change comes unintended consequences, and measuring them and understanding them is absolutely critical, as you say, Alon, if we're going to make the difference that's called for by Earth at this point. I mean, I feel like you're asking for a nuanced conversation, and that's not really what we do here in America. <laughs> not in America. Um, so no. this is a, let's be honest. Uh, this is a little bit self-serving, but because we're doing this adaptation coverage, I wonder how much you see the technologies that you're developing, the sensor tech, the, the business models, and the knowledge uh, as critical to adaptation efforts when you start to deal with companies or locations or parts of the world that suddenly have less water or way more water than they expected? Yeah, we think the 
use of digital technology in a whole host of areas is going to be hugely beneficial. I mean, we have big, big scale challenges on Earth, right? How do you feed 9 billion people without deforesting the balance of Earth? How do you, you know, manage water when it's already going to be in a crisis situation? We haven't really felt the demand going on. And scale problems are going to take scale solutions. So, and you know, there, there are a lot of people really committed to it. We don't have all the answers. Digital is going to be huge. So already today, we're managing the water and the power plants that generate 27% of the world's electricity. And so as a consequence, and we're doing this across the world, we have unbelievable data about most efficient, least efficient. Some people need X, you know, 4x the water per kilowatt than others. So what are they doing differently? And with digital, we can bring this to life in a much different way. So we already have what I would call sensors, and we're managing this at a customer assurance center. It happens to be in Pune, India, where we have engineers all day long monitoring to make sure that water quality is staying on, that we're doing the reduction that we commit to and all this. But we can do this even much smarter than that in the future, and digital is going to be key. How do you bring it together? How do you show best in class? How do you show the steps to get to water reduction? We can do this in bottling operations, beverage operations, food plant operations, dairy operations. We touch 40% of the dairy produced in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have these, but really, this is a lot of data. You know, a bunch of people with yeah. Excel, we can keep them busy. But it's very God, I difficult. I hope it's not Excel. Right? You're yeah. killing me, Todd. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we'll kill ourselves, right? And so we really do need, this is a real big mission in our company, yeah. is leveraging digital for good in terms of improving food safety, reducing the amount of water, reducing the amount of energy and all the processes. I got some AI people you can talk to later. I did not get to questions from the audience, I apologize, uh, but hopefully you'll check your Twitter later. I already heard him give his email out backstage to somebody, so he's very accessible. Yeah, great. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Appreciate the conversation.